Hi, and welcome to Life, Death, and the Space Between podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Amy Robbins, and today, tomorrow, and Friday, I'm going to be dropping some old episodes. I'm re-releasing these episodes as a tribute to my mentor, my friend, my teacher, and who I called my soul mama, Ariana Garrett. Ariana sadly lost her life to cancer this weekend, and to say that I'm devastated would be an understatement. I first started working with Ariana about five years ago, and I had, at the time, had just was was rounding out my own therapeutic work in traditional therapy. I had been in therapy, if you've heard me talk, for many, many years. My therapist was retiring, and I felt like I was ready for a new way of being in therapy, of thinking about really shifting towards doing more work around energy and different types of healing, and felt like what better way, as I always have, as to be on the other side of that ex- experience. Uh, and so I started with Ariana at the recommendation of a friend. And she and I, over the course of the past five, five and a half years, not only developed a very, very deep and meaningful, I guess you could call it therapeutic relationship, a coaching relationship, but also a friendship and a mentorship. And I believe that there is no one that can explain the soul better than she could. There was no one who understood the soul better than she did. And there's no one who could certainly help manifest shit faster than she could help manifest shit. She was a magical where that is concerned. And it just felt right to me to reshare her wisdom, her knowledge. I'm so grateful that I was able to record it, that I have some of this already because I'm, as, as we all do when we lose someone that we love so deeply and so dearly, we scramble to find memories that we have of them to make sure that we don't lose that. And the fact that I have her voice recorded here, that I have meditations that we did together is so meaningful to me. And I want to just remind all of you of her work in this world because I feel incredibly blessed that I was able to learn from her. And I feel honestly a little bit lost right now and unsure about how I'm going to move forward without her behind me in a physical body. And it is certainly challenging my faith. It's certainly challenging my belief. And it is definitely forcing me to sort of ratchet up uh, my own meditations right now, my own grounding right now, my own sadness right now, and really pushing me to dig in to what it means to lose someone you love when you have a belief system that says that they will carry on on the other side. And in the moments where I've been sobbing and wondering how my life will look without her. I've also been questioning. And I think that what I hope that I will find in the coming weeks, and what I do know on some level I will find, is that she is still there with me. But right now, that doesn't feel like enough. And so I will continue to grieve. I will continue to miss And I will continue to wish that she was here in a physical body. And I will continue to also have faith that she will be able to guide me from the other side. And I look forward to our relationship continuing in that way. And I hope that you all can take something from these next couple days of podcasts that I'm sharing with you that she shared with me, her wisdom, her soul, her light because it will be missed by so many. And I just hope that you can all take a little piece of her wisdom with you over the next few days. 
Welcome back, Ariana, to Life, Death, and the Space Between podcast today. Oh, it's great to be back here. I love what you're doing. So last time we spoke, we talked about the concept of a soul. And today we're going to dig in a bit more and talk about the soul and how a soul transitions. And so for us again, can you describe, for those who didn't hear the first podcast and maybe are just tuning in, what exactly is a soul? And what are we talking about here when we talk about soul? Okay, great question, Amy. And the soul, if you can think of it as your higher self, your pure self, or the more transcendent aspect of yourself. Um, We don't have a soul, we are a soul. So um, the qualities of the soul are pure love and creativity and presence and compassion. So all of those positive qualities, those things that we think of as being a good human being, Those are attributes of the soul. So the soul is always working through a personality. And the personality is kind of the particular role that you have taken on in time and space. So the personality and the soul, they're always working together, or hopefully working together anyway, um, and coming to greater unity. But the the personality is, you know, Amy, um, you know, the, the, the temporary form that, that the soul has created and inhabits and works through. Um, the personality is made up of your mind and all of the, the habitual patterns of thought. It's made up of your emotions and your typical emotional responses are part of the personality. Um, it's the physical body, the energy body that holds it all together. So you've got this kind of basic duality of the soul and its pure state is transcendent. And then the personality is more the form in time and space. And so what we're doing on the spiritual path is we're actually working to embody soul energy, soul force. We're trying to bring that which we are in our more pure transcendent state into expression in this time, in this place, through whatever life experiences you're creating. So it's this beautiful union of soul and personality that we're working to achieve. And, and I prefer using terminology like personality rather than ego, mm-hmm. you know, because mm-hmm. ego has so many negative connotations. Okay? But the idea is that the more soul unity we achieve, the more the personality becomes an expression of positive qualities. Okay, where the idea of the ego, it's always a fairly negative concept of the right. egos getting in the way and, and all. So the personality is something that is constantly being transformed and uplifted and um, attuned to the vibration of the soul. And that's what embodiment is about, is, is embodying the qualities of the soul. So that's what our earthly journey is all about, is about attuning to that soul force and bringing it into our lives and living more fully as the soul every day. So what has been your experience working with souls? I mean, I know obviously you're always working with people who, as you so beautifully said, were not separate. I'm not even going to requote you right. We're, we are a soul. We don't have a soul. We are a soul. Mm -hmm. Um, But you know, I know a big part of your work is that you always focus on the soul when it's in a physical body. But what about when it leaves the body? And how do we understand that? I mean, I think a lot of people struggle with, well, why doesn't my soul rem- remember, in, in quotes, from lifetime to lifetime what I experienced, what happens? Um, so what has been your experience with all of that? Well, the soul attunement um, oftentimes comes with spiritual practice and meditation. Um, Not always, but if your spiritual practice is about attuning to soul, then what happens as you do those practices, you become more aware of the subtle life that is behind everything. There's a soul behind everything. You know, your dog, your cat, the plants in your house, the furniture, there's a consciousness. The consciousness is another word for soul. And so as we kind of 
turn our attention inward to the more subtle levels of being, then we begin to, we begin to experience life in a whole new way. We begin to experience the consciousness behind the outer form or the soul behind the personality. And, you know, many years ago, I started doing spiritual practices and just noticed I would start attuning to people and trees and, and life more in, in subtle ways. And I began to know things that I had no outer way of knowing. Mm -hmm. But there was this kind of soul communion or a connection in consciousness mm -hmm. that was made um, that went deeper um, than the mind, deeper than the emotions, deeper than a physical connection. And um, so, you know, I began in my practice to be aware of that with people and what was happening beyond the thoughts and words that were going through their mind. What was the bigger picture? Where was the soul leading them? And um, at some point, then people just started showing up in my life who were about to make their life transition. And I had the realization that, oh, I could be helpful here because I could attune to, to them as souls and carry that connection and awareness after they dropped their body, after their physical body died and could still be aware of them as a soul and what they were experiencing as a soul. So can you walk us through what that looks like? Mm -hmm. and what that looks like for you, what that looks like for them? Yeah, the, the life transition process. Mm -hmm. that, mm -hmm. Okay, well, great. And, and um you know, it's a, it's a kind of a, a long process to begin with. People often think of death as usually something that just happens in one breath. But in actuality, it's the, the, the last breath is the result of oftentimes a long process. And if you can look at the process by which a soul comes into a body or comes into an incarnation, it's usually a long process. You know, if you look at from the point of conception to the point of adulthood, um, you know, it, that takes a lot of years mm -hmm. for the soul to come into a body and claim it and, again, come to a relative maturity. Okay, so, you know, arguably, you know, some people think maturity is at 18 years. I think it's more like 30. Yeah, uh, I think it's moving <laughs> from the psychological perspective. It's moving, you know, closer and closer to 30. Uh -huh. and, it's, and it's now called emerging adulthood in your right. own way. <laughs> yeah, and that, that is definitely my experience. Um, so the point of transition of leaving the body is oftentimes happens in stages. Okay? And there are three really clear cut stages. And there are actually three choices to be made along the way for different parts of our being. So when the soul is ready to come out of incarnation, there's a, a soul choice that is made. And usually the choice to die is because that the personality, the form that the soul is inhabiting, there, there's no longer any room to grow or expand or change. Okay. So okay. I so, think that people, when they hear the choice to die, that's going to be very powerful, right? I mean, like uh -huh. I think most people would say on a personality level, you know, short of when someone dies by suicide, which is a whole nother conversation, most people would not choose to die. Like, I think that's certainly the feedback I've gotten is like, I don't want to be thinking about that. I don't want to die. I like it here. I'm liking this life. I don't want to make another, you know, I know people struggle and not everybody likes their life, but people don't want to die. So why would someone, why would a soul choose to die? I think you said, because there's no more room for growth here. And that's, that's an amazing way to think about it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and, you know, usually people don't think of choosing to die because they're not attuned to their soul enough to be a conscious part of that decision. It feels like it's something outside of their control because of the separation between the soul and the personality. 
but you get some people and it could be in their elder years or when they're younger where they realize they're um, they can't grow anymore in their current life situation so the soul may choose to pull out of a body die um, if if there's illness in the physical body okay so if the soul can't work through that personality anymore then it it will sometimes choose to pull out to then take its next step on in another realm in another way um, so that so, the soul can continue to grow and what exactly is right, the soul growing towards right. Okay. Well, the soul is growing towards an actualization of its truest self. So a greater actualization of love and creativity and presence. And do we ever get there? Well, I believe we we continue to grow and grow and grow and um, that there's no point of arrival, that there's just point of expansion. So... You go to one mountaintop and then you see another and you grow in, you know, in new ways mm-hmm. and expanded ways. And so, but so the, cho- the soul may choose to cut, to, you know, move on um, because of illness. It could be because of constriction in the thinking of a personality. Like if a person is so narrow minded that they can't grow anymore. Mm-hmm. Um, then the soul is, it's kind of wasting time being in a body, okay? It's, it's time to move on. The soul may choose to move on if a particular purpose has been accomplished. Maybe you lived a really good and beautiful life and it's just, there's no more to do. Like you've, you've completed what you were here to do in mm-hmm. that body. So that would be when a soul would, would move on. Um, there's a beautiful film called Antonia's Line and um, it's about a woman and it's her whole life story and post-World War II and just a beautiful story of this woman's growth and expansion and as an elderly woman, you know, she called all of her family into her room and basically said, I'm going to die today. And then she did, you know, she said her goodbyes and released her body. And it was a beautiful and peaceful experience. Now, that isn't the norm in our culture. Right. Um, but, you know, it's sometimes, um, you know, the soul would pull out because uh, the life has been well lived. And so it just, there's a natural completion to the cycle. So it can be many of those um, different reasons. Either the soul can't grow or a cycle is complete, though, Mm -hmm. in essence. So I'm, that, I'm going for a complete cycle. <laughs> yes, and that's absolutely. what I'm going for. <laughs> <laughs> absolutely. Um, and there's a certain kind of acceptance um, when that happens. You see people, I think, who are attuned to their soul, um, and they, you know, they feel ready to go. Mm-hmm. They feel the limitations of their body. Mm-hmm. Um, my, my father was like that. Um, he was in his 70s. Um, he had lung cancer. He knew he had only several months to live. And he just said, yeah, I am ready to die. I'm ready to go. So doctors would come in the hospital room and he would introduce himself and, and then say, you know, I'm ready to die. Can you help me die? You know, and the doctors were blown away because most of the people they dealt with were people trying to... Um, get the doctor's help to keep living. Mm -hmm. But he recognized the limitations of his physical body, that he was never going to be able to have a full and active life. And so, you know, he he let go. And and that's a good example of, you know, first there's a soul choice, then there's the personality choice of the person, you know, here in their full awareness being aligned with that soul choice. And sometimes it's not that. No. It's, <laughs> More often it's a lot of times. Not, right? Not the, the personality is sort of fighting against the soul. Yeah, the personality, you know, is programmed for survival. And so to be able to shift gears um, and to, you know, align with the soul 
choice that's saying, okay, this cycle is done, or you can't grow in this situation anymore. It's time to move on. That a lot of people have a really hard time um, coming into harmony with that soul choice and for the personality to be aligned. And sometimes it's that they'll never get there. But maybe sometimes through years of illness, the personality will just be in a place where, look, you know, maybe they've had cancer for years and have been fighting and fighting a disease. And, you know, at some point the personality just says, I give up. I'm, you know, this is, this is not working for me anymore, Mm -hmm. you know, or I've had a good life. I let go. You know, there's, um, there are all kinds of different ways that people can come to that personality choice and all kinds of different ways that we can resist it as well. Right. Right. So like, I mean, I could tell you right now that my personality would not be very aligned with my soul right now. <laughs> you know, it, you know it, it came to that. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and I have a lot of comfort in, in truly believing that when we die, we don't die and our soul lives on and we're still connected to the people we love. But I think, you know, not just me, certainly a lot of people that I speak to feel like, but I want to be here. Mm-hmm. This is, you know, I want to see my kids grow up and I want to mm-hmm. feel the sun on my face and I want to, you know, experience those personality pieces of life. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And so you're, you feel really anchored in this world, <laughs> you know, like your, your soul hasn't made that choice to move on. And so your life force is more here and, you know, and very strong and very vibrant and very alive. Okay. But if that change, um, you know, you may find a whole different experience in mm-hmm. your personality life. You know, it, go ahead. Yeah. No, I was just going to say, I, I feel like I sort of, you said something and then I had a million questions. In response <laughs> to that, and I think I got away from the original question, which was, was you started talking about what it looks like when a soul transitions. Okay. Well, and I want to talk just about that third choice though as well, because it's part of the process. So that's why soul transitions look so different for different people according to how they navigate those choices. Um, The last one is like, it's a choice made by the physical body intelligence. Okay, so the actual body that's programmed to survive and to keep breathing and to do whatever it takes to survive. Okay, so there's a so there's a natural progression from soul and completing and then the personality completing and then the actual physical body completing and letting go. And that's the last breath. Okay. okay. So those happen now anywhere along the way we can fight that process or not go along with it. Okay. So, and I have sat with people who are making their life transition and their soul is clearly gone. And what does that look like? That looks like being hooked up to machines and and not being able to feel the essence of a person there. And sometimes people are hooked up to machines and their soul is still very much there and their body may be in the process of healing. That's very common with comas. Mm -hmm. It's like they're not, some comas are the resistance of the physical body intelligence of letting go. And some comas are just healing comas where the person, the soul hasn't made that choice to move on. The personality hasn't made the choice to move on and the body just needs resting time, healing time. Mm -hmm. So there's that inner connection, right? When we say mind, body, soul, Mm-hmm. You know, yeah. we're not just talking about going to yoga and eating some veggies. Here. <laughs> no, you know, we are intimately, you know, woven together, those different parts of ourselves, yet they have um, different kinds of intelligence and they're programmed in different ways. See, part of why it's hard for us to think of the soul choosing to go out of incarnation is because we are 
focused as a personality and as the physical body. And the physical body's programming is for survival above all else. Mm-hmm. Right? I mean, yeah. that's what... <laughs> right. I see danger. I respond yeah. by trying to not to die. Exactly. Now, the bigger soul perspective is that there are cycles, that there's a time for letting go. There's, you know, it's a, it's a whole different way of, I guess, maneuvering through life. Mm -hmm. It's about growth, expansion, learning, loving, and creating, where the physical body just wants to survive. Well, and it really does. I mean, it, it's interesting because the world around us is sort of programmed in the way of living and dying, right? Like the seasons, Mm -hmm. transformations, things like that are very much about dying and coming back, dying Mm -hmm. and coming back, dying Mm -hmm. and coming back. (laughs) I can tell you it's like negative 15 here. There's not a lot living. Um, Right. But in the spring, everything will come back again, right? But we are so separate from that. And I think that that's one of the real challenges in our culture right now is we have become separate from those natural cycles. And so we forget that there are seasons. And and so it's, it's um, harder to attune to that. It's harder to live that. So there's a sense of just the immediacy of, I want to hold on. Mm-hmm. And I, I believe that sometimes that is dementia is where the soul has chosen to move on, but the personality and the body intelligence are not going along with that. Mm-hmm. That and not always, and these are generalizations. Right, so there are, right. You know, many different uh, types of dementia and ways is that that it emerges. But um, where you know, it's like the personality is like, nope, I'm not letting go. I'm not. I'm not willing to face the completion of my cycle Mm -hmm. as I am right now. And um, so, but the more we embrace those, the cyclic nature of life, the more we realize, okay, well, you know, I trust that there's going to be some other form, some other expression that will emerge. Um, So the point in all of this is is (laughs) that um, soul transitions look very different for different people because of the way they make those choices or the way that they resist those choices. Okay? So someone who is really embracing that, okay, it's my time to go. I let go. I, you know, take care of my unfinished business. I, you know, do what I need to do and then release. That life transition is going to look a, um, a lot more joyful a lot more peaceful. There's going to be more love involved. Um, Other life transitions can really look and be torturous, you know, can be very, very difficult. Mm -hmm. And people cannot even maybe realize that they have made their life transition, that their body has taken its last breath um, because of, you know, kind of resistance to that, that whole process. And that means that they're stuck, like when people talk about purgatory or hell or, well, mm-hmm. purgatory, I guess, is different mm-hmm. than hell, right? Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah. this in the in-between, I mean, I remember mm-hmm. new fun tidbit about me when I was in my old house and I started getting in contact and having more contact with people who had passed, I, I always heard a baby crying. Mm-hmm. and it wasn't my baby. I didn't even have a baby at the time. And mm-hmm. I really felt like there must have been a soul that got stuck and couldn't, couldn't cross over, couldn't make that transition. Is that sort of what you're mm-hmm. talking about here? Yeah, absolutely. And that often happens in um, situations where there is an accident and a sudden death or a young death, because the the soul and the personality were kind of preparing for a certain life trajectory, you know, and in our culture now, it's commonly accepted that you get usually 80 some years of life, you know, so there's that expectation. And so that if something is very sudden, or if, a, you know, a child is very young, or I've even seen it with, you know, a woman who I worked with who was in her 30s, and she did not know she died. 
um, that that a part of her consciousness was kind of trapped in between. And so yeah. what does that mean? I wish yeah. people could see my face okay. right now because I'm <laughs> my eyes. My daughter would say, Mom, don't have those big eyes. They're freaking me out. <laughs> okay. Well, what that means is, it, and it's not necessarily, um, it, it's not that the soul doesn't know it's made the transition. It's that parts of the personality don't realize what's happening. Parts of the personality are caught in between. Okay. Gotcha. So, okay. so um, so for instance, I saw this with my grandfather and he was, you know, quite elderly. He was in, well, let's see, he was 92 when he passed away and he was losing his sight. He was losing his hearing. Um, he had a very, you know, narrow life. He couldn't really take care of himself at that point. And um, one night I received a phone call from my mother that he had passed and we just spoke very quickly because I knew she needed to call, you know, other people. And, um, I immediately went into meditation and I was doing training at the time, which was many years ago in energy healing. And so I went into meditation to just send him love and to just kind of wish him a peaceful transition to say prayers for him and, and all. And, so I sat down and I closed my eyes and I tuned into him and I was immediately caught in this, it was like being in a tornado. It was this huge swirl of energy and literally I, like, I could feel my body being tossed around and I was coughing and choking and it was you know, very difficult and I, I had never experienced anything like this and I kept my hand, kept going like to my throat, it kept going up to my throat and my mouth and And um, what I realized very quickly is that that is what granddaddy was feeling. Like I attuned to him and I was able to feel what he was feeling. I'm very empathic and can, you know, connect with people in that way. And so when I realized that, like I found my own stable center in the midst of everything that was happening. And I said, granddaddy, it's okay. You know, your body has died, but you're okay. Your soul will live on and is living on, and and it's all right. And he kind of, like, it took a little while of, you know, kind of telling him that, and it wasn't with words, but it was just with the kind of connecting energetically in communion with him Mm -hmm. and communicating that, that he was okay. You know, and to just let go of his body, that it was okay. And he finally got that, and the swirling stopped. And I, I realized that um, he, he realized what was happening. And at that point, he became calm, and he continued to move onward in his journey. And I could feel his peace coming. And I could feel that I had helped him to understand what was happening in that moment. And I could turn my attention elsewhere. So when this was all over, I called my mother back and and I just, you know, asked her, how did he die? Well, it was all very sudden, um, but he had pneumonia. And they put a breathing tube down his throat when they took him to the hospital. And he didn't want it. And he kept trying to pull it out. And he kept trying to tell them that he didn't want it. And so it was a very difficult transition for him. And so even though his body had taken his last breath, parts of his personality were still caught in the trauma of that experience of feeling the pain in his throat, not wanting the breathing tube. And so those were like still had life force in them. And so, you know, me coming in, helping to explain what had happened, helped to liberate him from that energy that was um, still there, that traumatic energy, that choking, that fear. And so I helped to calm him down so that he could let go, leave that fear behind, 
And at one point in that process, he said, is this hell? And I reassured him that no, it wasn't. He was just in transition and that the more he let go, the easier that transition would be. And so it ended up being, you know, I I think a very healing experience for him and it helped to make his transition move on. And, you know, at the time I had no idea about the breathing tomb, you know, all the coughing and sputtering that I was going through. um, It didn't really make sense. But then when I found out that he, you know, had, had had that breathing tube in the hospital, it all made sense. Um, It also made sense that he didn't know he died because his waking consciousness before death was kind of a cloudy experience because he was losing his sight, because he was losing his hearing. There wasn't the dramatic change of perception that there often is, say, with a younger person or a person who is very clear-minded and, you know, whose sight is clear and sharp. Um, So for him, you know, it just, he lived in kind of a muddled, swirling world a little bit when he was alive. And so it was hard for him to recognize that he'd made his transition. So that's where, you know, helpers either in body or on the other side can, can help with making the transition more peaceful and more loving. And Interestingly, um, about a year after this happened, he, um, I was driving one day and he came to me and it was as though he was just sitting on my shoulder driving with me and he had some messages for um, my father and he had a, wanted to say a few other things that were part of his completion process And he said he's ready to fully let go now. Um, He's ready to let go of his life as it was and let go of his home, and which had been on the market and had just been sitting there and not selling. And it was a beautiful, beautiful connection that we had. And it was just a, a sense of him honoring me for the help that I had given him honoring me for who I was and how he could see me from the other side in a way that he hadn't been able to when he was in a physical body. And it was very healing for me. And then the messages that I gave to my father were were very healing as well. And interestingly enough, um, about two weeks later, you know, his house that had been on the market for almost a year, um, it sold. So, (laughs) you know, there is definitely a connection between what is happening on the other side and uh, what is happening here in this physical reality. And the more we're attuned to our own soul, the more our soul can bridge those worlds and it becomes natural to kind of know life on a deeper level and to know a more multi-dimensional expression of life. So how can we ensure that this process is peaceful and not like, because I think people would be scared to hear that Mm -hmm. he struggled in this way or that his soul struggled in, in, you know, you experienced the choking and that someone was going through that. And I feel like that's a lot of what people's concerns are when either they think about their own death or they think about their a loved one passing is that it's going to be painful or that they're going to struggle or that they're going to be fighting. And, mm-hmm. you know, no one wants to think of that because it's frankly not very uplifting. <laughs> and, mm-hmm. but where is sort of the hope in that? Well, the hope in that, Amy, is is that that of all the life transitions that I've been a part of, that was one of the most difficult. Overall, 
most of the deaths that I've been a part of have been full of love and appreciation and gratitude and downright bliss mm-hmm. and and just all good feelings and, and good experiences. And that struggle was a part of his transition, but it was really a very short part. So, you know, he went into a more peaceful state very quickly, very, very quickly. So, you know, like anything in life, you know, there's sometimes moments where it's difficult, mm-hmm. moments where we're experiencing something that's beyond our comfort zone and we experience it, you know, as a bit of struggle. But for the most part, life transitions are full of beauty and a sense of homecoming. And and I know, you know, and maybe we should do a podcast and, and talk about all of those <laughs> sometimes. Well, well, it's interesting because <laughs> I just interviewed a woman. I'm not sure if it'll air before this part. I think it'll probably have aired already. Um, who researches final final words? Uh-huh. And mm-hmm. it's her book is called Words in Transition, and she talks about the final words that people say, and it's very much about what you're talking about: mm-hmm. a sense of coming home, a sense of going to something exciting, a sense of beauty, a sense of um, just bliss. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's really a shame that we can't remember that (laughs) because I think then maybe it wouldn't be so frightening. Mm -hmm. Well, and what I too see is that my grandfather was a man with um, unfinished business. You know, that he hadn't spent his life growing and evolving and doing his spiritual work and his growth work. So mm-hmm. most of the people that I have worked with are people who are on a path of spiritual awakening. They are on a path of psychological growth. They're dealing with their unfinished business as a way of life. They're growing and evolving day by day, lesson by lesson. Um, so they're learning to love more fully, to you know, create better lives, to create more happiness in their family and their work and all of that. So I think that a lot of how you die is very much related to how you live. Mm. You know, and there's the, the takeaway, right? That's it. That's yeah, the I heart think of it. Listen till the end. <laughs> but that's that to me is the big takeaway is that how you die is very much reflective of how you live. And that's why I'm doing this is mm-hmm. again, I want people to live more fully, more connected, more, and you and I have talked about this like for hours and hours and hours, right? Is how we can help live, pe- help people live more connected lives. And I think. Yes. Well, and also the good news about my grandfather, though, is, is again, that period that was difficult was very short. And, you know, he got past it. Um, and when I would tune into him after that, it was, <sighs> he was in a very peaceful place. <laughs> And, you know, on the other side, I have had the experience of recognizing that there are guides and teachers and healers who help people learn the lessons they didn't learn on this side to see with the vaster vision. And so when he came back to me a year later, I had just the instant recognition that he had spent a year like learning and healing and doing his spiritual work that, you know, maybe someone in a physical body would have done in therapy, you know, that he had spent that time on the other side. So it's never too late. Mm -hmm. It's incredibly positive, um, you know, that, that, okay, even if, if we don't kind of get things all figured out while we're in this body, we have so many opportunities to learn on the other side and to bring healing and to see things, see the vaster vision of life and to feel more love. And when he came back, I just felt incredible love, incredible acceptance. You know, he was not suffering. He was not in a bad state at all. So it's, for me, um, working with people in their life transitions has made me more excited than ever about being a human being and helped me to touch into greater states of love and bliss and beauty and recognition of the, just the, the, um, 
the beauty of our whole experience mm-hmm, as humans, mm-hmm. and the importance of our connections. That's what always comes back over and over and over in life transitions is it's the connections that count. It's the love shared, the people that we have woven into our lives and, you know, that that's what it's all about. So for well, me, that that's a- seems like a perfect place to end today. Okay. So great. I love that. And, you know, again, people have heard from you a couple of times now, but you do this work with people on various levels. Um, I'm not dying. I worked, I, we yes. worked together. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, I shouldn't say I'm not dying because we're all dying, right? I mean, right. Um, but we are, people can find you at arianagarrett.com. They can get on your email list. They can hear about the work that you do, which is really about embodying the soul. So ultimately, when you get to that place of ending in this physical body, it is a beautiful, peaceful. I mean, I know that's not just kind of how you put yourself out there, but that that's really what it is, is how to live this life fully and connected because ultimately that's what matters. Like what you heard today and want to hear more? Wondering what comes next and what it all means? Head over to Apple Podcast, Spotify, Stitcher, Google Play, or anywhere you get your podcasts and hit subscribe. Also, if you could take a minute to rate and review my podcast, I would really appreciate it. Stay tuned as we continue to explore life, death, and the space between.